Hey, queridos, ¿cómo van? Todo bien aquí, ¿tú? Bien, a la feliz 2023, feliz tercera temporada. Feliz Igualmente. tercera temporada. Se te extraña este lado, ¿eh? Igualmente, no. igualmente. Ah, ah. José acaba de hablar por él mismo, güey, la neta. Ay, yo sé que muy bien, yo sé que, yo sé que muy bien el, muy en el fondo de tu corazón de mexicano. Bien verga, güey. Muy, muy en el fondo de tu corazón mexicano me extrañas, querido. Oye, weón, pero estáis hablando en español, hemos eh, quedado a hacerlo en inglés este capítulo, weón. Que vaya a cambiar. Vamos, que... vamos, vamos, que, vamos, queremos sí, queremos sí, demostrar sí. que somos bilingües. Ah, también. Vale, ah, este mal, claro, o sea, claro, por lo menos, que... no menos, o por lo menos lo intentamos, güey. Así que a ti te cuesta un poquito más, Max, pero pues, güey, sí, gracias, pero güey. Pero vamos a ver, vamos a ver. Si el español no cuesta, imagínate <ríe> el inglés. Tiene un español en chileno, cara. <ríe> pero bueno, no, gente, en verdad. Bienvenidos a la tercera temporada de 8000 kilómetros. Muchísimas gracias a todas aquellas personas que nos estuvieron escuchando eh, por las vacaciones, que nos estuvieron escribiendo por las vacaciones. Agradecemos los mensajes, una chimba, se los agradecemos. Y nada, esta tercera temporada va a llegar igual con nuevos invitados, eh, va a llegar con, con más temas, con la industria musical está cambiando de una manera muy interesante, entonces queremos indagar en diferentes aspectos, al igual vamos a seguir con el suave para que vayan y revisen más recomendaciones musicales al final de cada mes, los estamos sacando y cada semana, los fines de semana estamos posteando unas guías con recomendaciones que cada uno hacemos de las canciones o lanzamientos que nos han cautivado recientemente. Entonces vayan, revísenlo, escúchenlos y nos comentan qué, qué, qué opinan. Pero bueno, como para ir llamándonos en el asunto, este, este episodio lo vamos a grabar en inglés. Eh, entonces, first I want to welcome our guest. He's a highlighted accomplished professional who's a bachelor, who has a bachelor's degrees in economics from La Pontificia Universidad Católica de Perú. He has worked in the banking industry for more than three years, and then he went to NYU to study music business. Felipe was recently involved in the study conducted by the consulting con company Musonomics, which is the company of the NYU professor Larry Miller. The study was a deep dive into how the streaming has impacted the value of music, and it was a work about Dima, which Felipe will explain to us a little bit later what it was all about. And currently he's, a, uh, he's working at Reservoir as a finance investment intern. And we're very excited to, ha to have him here on the show and to learn about his experiences and talk a little bit more about catalogs. So please join us and give a big round of applause to Felipe Garrido. Hi, Felipe, hi how's it going? Uh, very thankful uh, for, uh, to you for having me here. Um, I'm very happy to meet you all. Uh, so yeah, thank you. Um, uh, I can comment a little bit on the uh, study that we did uh, with Musonomics. So like I mentioned to you earlier, uh, yeah, this was a paper, a research paper that we did for DEMA which is the Digital Media Association, basically an organization that represents music streaming platforms. And, uh, you know, it is undisputed that streaming has had a huge importance in the recent increase in the value of music copyrights. However, the discussion of trying to estimate a number for it was always present am amongst the, the constituents of this industry. So Dima's expectation was, of course, for us to estimate a very big contribution, um, but we tried to be as unbiased and, and as methodologically correct as possible. This, this was a paper that was, uh, it kind of with the participation of many music industry experts, uh, economist Will Page, the author of Tarzan Economics, catalog valuation gurus like David Dunn, Barry Masarsky, and many researchers from top think tanks, such as media research also helped us with it. So yeah, I was very proud of the paper. Uh, we, we made some uh, very interesting, we got some very interesting insights. Uh, so yeah, it's definitely a uh, uh, reading I recommend. That's, that's very cool. And just to, just to make sure, like this paper was uh, asked for by Dima for you guys to do just to make sure that streaming is increasing the value of music. Somehow DSPs could, could keep like arguing or defending the point on probably decreasing the value of royalty, royalties to be paid to the right holders. Is that right? Well, yeah. So Dima basically represents the DSPs. Uh, so it, it is in their best interest to uh, to show themselves as the, the drivers of this industry, which they are. 
Um, but uh, of course, there are points in the streaming business that can be criticized. Uh, but this paper was completely, completely uh, unbiased. And uh, the, we, we didn't really feel the need to, to change any of the numbers. Um, so pretty comfortable with the results of the, of the research. And it's inevitable to just ignore how important streaming has become for the music industry, not just for, for, for the recording side, but also yeah. a big, big hype for, for catalogs, editorial side, the, the publishing side. So mm -hmm. before we dive like into the thick of it, uh, let's talk about a little bit of some of the concepts and historic context, because this is something that has been happening for a long, long time that what we're living right now is the product of the work of past artists or past initiatives that has happened, that has driven us to the today's big catalog, uh, let's say, hype. Yeah, so we can start by just de uh, defining uh, some basic concepts. So yeah, I mean, in the study, we, we focus on the deals of catalog buyouts. So for this, we have to understand what a music catalog is. So it refers to the ownership of the music copyright of a certain number of songs. Uh, therefore, the, the person who owns this, they become the sole recipient of the royalties that those songs accrue. Now, th there are two types of ownerships, uh, master ownerships, which is the sound recording co uh, copyright, and publishing uh, uh, ownership, uh, which is just the underlying song. In other words, the songwriting intellectual property. So in many instances, the record label are the ones who hold the ownership of the master's copyright, uh, which is what ignited, you know, the, the Taylor Swift um, recent efforts to regain ownership of her masters. However, for the publishing rights, some writers always hold either a percentage or the totality of, uh, of, of those copyrights, which is known as the songwriter share. It can be it's usually around 50% or 75% of, uh, of uh, uh, the ownership. Yeah. In cases, it can be 100% if it's um, an, a legacy artist. It depends on uh, the songwriter's career because there, there is a reversion down the road when, when they can get 100% of the, of the copyright. Um, so it also depends on the contractual provisions of the publishing deals that they may have gotten previously. So these catalogs are being valued as financial assets now. And as such, they have started to be traded or sold by copyright holders to different parties in the music industry. Uh, in order to do this, what most professionals do is create a predictive model that intends to foresee the future performance of a catalog, as to realize what the future cash flow from the ownership of it would render. Uh, bringing those future cash flows to present value using an investor adequate cost of capital which at the time I've seen it oscillates around 8% in the industry, mm -hmm. but don't quote me on that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> allows buyers to, um, and sellers to set a price for these catalogs. So the realized price after the transaction is often expressed in terms of a financial multiple. Oh, uh, okay. It's expressed over the net revenue uh, that the catalog earns. This net revenue is, uh, in the case of uh, sound recording copyrights, is referred uh, to as the net label share or NLS. <clears throat> and publishing copyrights is referred to as a net publishing share or NPS. So, for example, if a music publishing catalog earns an average of $100,000 in one year, um, you take the average of, of the last five years, for example, um, these $100,000 would be the NPS. Now, if someone buys this catalog for a million dollars, uh, it means it is being bought by 10 times the NPS. So in the final yeah. market, it is expressed that the music catalog was sold using a multiple, multiple of 10 times NPS. So we focused on these multiples in the, in the article that we wrote in the research, and we tried to correlate the multiples to the streaming revenues, try to control for other variables. And uh, so, yeah, this is basically what we have to understand. And, you know, about the history of it, I, I just wanted to touch on some uh, interesting anecdotes. There, there is, for example, the, I mean, the value of music copyrights is not really a new concept. Uh, there is the story of Paul McCartney, who is well known for owning many music catalogs. His publishing company, MPL, owns over 25,000 compositions, including Buddy Holly's, Carl Perkins, and many other pop standards. 
meaning that he's been doing what many businessmen like Mark Mercuriatis are doing now, Mark, Mark from Hypnosis, you know? So ironically, he spent the better part of his life without owning the Beatles catalog because Michael Jackson bought yeah. those yeah. catalogs back in 1985. Uh, and then there was this whole thing that uh, Sony ATV took control of. But the thing is that the value of catalogs have, has always been known by, by uh, industry leaders. The thing now is that the music industry is experiencing a sort of a boom so a lot of people want to get into that. Um, and well, the other interesting anecdote is about um, David Bowie, who in the in 1997, I believe, he issued uh, the, what is called the Bowie bonds. Bond. This was a securitization of his royalties, which means he issued uh, a triple A rated bonds that were backed by the royalties of his music catalog. And uh, it was probably not the best time to do it because the industry. Uh, went through a little bit of a downturn. So the bonds did not really fail, but it was downgraded to double B minus by the time uh, it matured 10 years after in, in 2007. But I think it was, uh, Bowie uh, was a visionary by doing this. Um, so yeah, this is a thing that has been happening for a while, but recently by the end of the 2010s, uh, specifically around 2018, I mean, there were some acquisitions here and there in the first half of the 2010s, but in 2018, the boom really started. Uh, huge names like Bob Dylan, Bruce Springsteen, Sting, <clears throat> Phil Collins, Shakira, Rachel Shield Peppers have all sold. I, and, um, I mean, they are only the tip of the, a gigantic list of artists that are selling their catalogs. And not only legacy artists like them, but also we can talk about John Legend, Justin Timberlake, or more recently, Justin Bieber, that was very well covered in media. Yeah. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of reasons to do this. Some artists need the money. Some are looking to retire. Um, others are soon by the tax benefits. You know, tax rates here in the U.S. are significantly lower for capital gains than for royalty earnings. So these deals have a lot of aspects to it. They're, they vary a lot. Some of them uh, sell a part of their catalogs. Some sell both masters and publishing. Some sells only a percentage of it. Some retain the right to, to have a say in, in what the, the in, in what uh, sources the catalog is being used. Um, so, yeah, I mean, what is interesting is that the multiples have gone from 10 to 11 times in the early 2010s to 25 or even 30 times. In now, we know these multiples are even are starting to uh, reach up, reaching a plateau or even out. Uh, but the appetite for catalogs continues to be huge and more and more bespoke investors are willing to take on higher risk now. So uh, right now, as we speak, younger and younger artists are uh, being offered deals for this and in a much wider genre, uh, uh, genre range, you know, uh, some people are starting to get uh, interested in urban music, hip hop, Latin reggaeton. So I believe this is a fantastic opportunity. Now, you're, now, now that you were like sharing a little bit of the history behind this, and we have seen that basically catalogs have been present through the entire music industry itself. It looks like, or it seems like, depending on the date there, that we have been seeing like boosts on how catalogs are like improving or like the sales are happening. For example, like the appearance of Napster, then in 2010, the appearance of all streaming platforms, and mm -hmm. just recently the appearance of COVID. Like, like all these phenomenons that kind of shook and like all the music industry to like, uh, we were like basically in chaos because yeah. no one didn't really didn't know what to do, how to survive, how to get money. Okay, like record labels are not selling records. Streaming platforms are developing a new ways of monetizing your music. We cannot play live. We cannot perform live yet. Like all these catalogs have uh, have been like there always, like in the back of our heads. Exactly. So it's like yeah. quite impressive. Yeah, I think it's pretty interesting. I, I think that a bunch of events ha have had to uh, align in order for this to happen. Uh, but it's a very, very interesting phenomenon. And Felipe, you were you were talking just uh, before Luis said this comment, you said times 30, which I think it's a huge number, like times 30 MPS, right? So um, yeah. I read but the article. Time, hmm? Sorry, uh, times 30 would be like an outlier in our database. Yeah. The average for twenty for uh, twenty twenty one or twenty twenty two was around twenty five, but S super interesting. Yeah. But do do you think that number is gonna like? Do you think it's 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 
it's a hard question, but do you think the number is fair, quote unquote, for nowadays, like given the state of the industry? Because times 25 means that you're expecting, like as an investor, you should be expecting 25 years of, of X revenue, like with some certainty, right? So I, I, exactly. I, I don't know. I, I, I wouldn't put my money in a times 25. Yeah, and I, and I is, work in the music business, so yeah, it is a very, a very um, uh, present discussion in the industry. Mm -hmm. A lot of uh, opinions on it. Some people actually believe it's a bubble. Some people say it's overpriced. Mm -hmm. uh, some uh, believe it's actually the result of the incentive investors have of trying to gamble. You know, I so basically. Hoping for an asset to be more valuable than, than they are actually um, paying for, and trying to lose a little bit in uh, in many deals and win big in a yeah. few. So uh, that is something that could also uh, uh, be related to it. And I mean, I think further down the conversation, uh, we're going to touch on some of the reasons why this may maybe happened. So maybe. We can Touch more on that uh, later on in the discussion, but but yeah, I think I think that's a fair a fair point. Uh, Felipe, you also mentioned, or it was mentioned in the study, uh, lasting relevance as one of the primary factors that conditions acquisitions. I guess uh, it's mainly because of, like Max mentioned, you want to know if you're paying 25 times the price. Okay, you want to know exactly that that is going to sustain over time. So I wondered if you could elaborate on that and explain to the audience how was lasting relevance categorized? How do you define lasting relevance for the audience, let's say, regarding catalogs? Right. Yeah. So this is um, a thing that we, we also wanted to discuss a little bit, or we can actually get into that to, to, to answer your question. So it has to do a lot with the context of um, why catalogs now are attractive to investors. And this has a lot to do with streaming. So at this point, we all know that streaming uh, is driving the increase of revenues in the music industry. Um, we know that 65% um, of the industry revenues come from streaming. And then more than half of the, of the publishing revenues come from streaming as well. So, okay, this has brought resilience to the music industry. This has brought um, certain money to the music industry. But what, what is more important, and it's related to the question that you were asking, is that uh, streaming actually is guaranteeing that the copyright holders make money and uh, in a very certain and stable way, because now consumers are once again willing to pay for music. And because Catalog Music has proved to, to account for over 66% of the music listening on streaming platforms. So this means that music that is older than 18 months is the, uh, the, the highest percentage of what drives the streaming growth. So the implication of this translates into a smoothening of the decay curve of catalogs. So yeah. usually music, after its release, uh, it reaches a peak in sales and then it descends and stabilizes. With streaming, this descent towards a stable point happens more slowly. And the convergence or a stable point happens in a higher level than before. The reason why this happens is because the streaming provides a stronger longevity for music. The presence in playlists and recommendation features have a dynamic that in the physical era, we didn't have that. A person would buy a CD or a vinyl and they would have to uh, buy this, this item again to, to have growth. Um, I mean, a consumer would never buy a CD or a vinyl again. So growth would only come from new listeners. With streaming economics, it's different. The scale has an exponential effect that produces over time. And the trajectory of a catalog becomes way more attractive in the long run. And it is also easier to track, model, and predict. Um, so this is very important to consider. However, you know, streaming is a model that continues to be subject uh, to discussion and criticism regarding sustainability and the way it pays artists. There is some speculation about how catalog bias could change that. Uh, some see it as a beacon of possible innovation in the future, given, given the new copyright holders have the market muscle to impulse solutions that bypass the needing of gatekeeping intermediaries. Uh, for others, the market power centralization just moves from one hand to the other. But this is a discussion that could go on for uh, forever. Uh, but yeah. yeah, basically streaming has brought uh, 
a longer st stability and relevance to music that allows for it to be valuable as a financial asset. I just wanted to add that maybe that's the biggest explanation of why we get these huge numbers of times 30 for some historic catalogs. Like, cause like mm -hmm. if you, I don't know, I don't want to like Red Hot Chili Peppers or a huge iconic artist. If you imagine the decay line, the decay curve of that catalog, it, I would imagine it like it doesn't reach zero at any point. Like it just stays at a, at a certain point, given the legend of that catalog. So mm -hmm. maybe as an investor, you would say, well, that's going to, it's like a bond that's going to keep paying and paying and paying and paying and paying, given the historical value it has, it will never mm -hmm. reach zero. So like, maybe that's the biggest reason to get numbers like times 30. Just wanted to. And, and also knowing that y these investors are getting uh, pointers, like let's, let's say, like, I don't know, like Warner or Primary Wave or Hypnosis, these are partners for these investors to, to administer these, these catalogs, right? So to keep like the music relevant, to keep the music somehow... Uh, like there on the mind of the of the audience, right? To eventually somehow, without even trying it, but because it's very dif difficult to fabricate uh, viral or cultural moments that will increase this line that we'll see stable through the future. But mm -hmm. somehow we like happened with uh, very recently. I, don't, I forgot the name of the artist, but happened very re recently again with last the Last of Us. They did a sync and the song did like a 700% increase on stream. It's like ridiculous. So this kind of, kind of administration also comes very handy for, for the investor because they know that the administrator is going to be there trying to create this cultural moment. I want to go back to the streaming side. Yes, it's very clear, like uh, the whole power of streaming and but there is something uh, that actually is happening right now. For instance, TikTok is gravitating towards AI music. It's just doing some tryouts, right? What could it happen at some point in the industry? We don't know. We're just speculating here. The music industry gravitates to something different from streaming, either streaming just like full support or the DSPs also, because the licensing is like way too expensive, they gravitate to something else, right? So where does all this fit? How the whole catalog buying hype be affected by any of these changes in the, in the streaming world? Right, yes. So the, uh, the hype of the catalogs is um, betting on the fact that monetization from copyright holders is gonna continue being strong. So um, digital disruption is something that has always been happening in this industry. Um, a big shocker was the Napster uh, event that pretty much knocked down every revenues that the industry were, were having. So a lot of people usually uh, speculate about a possible Napster event happening again, something in the lines of blockchain, something in the lines of eliminating the intermediary or the gatekeeping and having a system that allows uh, creators to um, access their consumer base directly without the need of a label, without the need of a publisher, without the need of a copyright holder. Um, if this were to happen, it is, in my opinion, it is even so very unlikely that uh, revenues are gonna go down because what, ha what streaming has made is also like, they have managed to make consumers pay for music again and being used to uh, pay for music again. So investors are betting on the fact that consumers are gonna continue paying music and music is not gonna reach that point, that Napster point in which it was free to access music. Uh, because regulations, it, regulations are all also like gravitating towards that towards not having copyright holders not be paid for, for this money. So the risk of, uh, of an event or a disruption that causes these catalogs to not be valuable is very, very low. That's why these investors are so comfortable with these assets. Um, so yeah, yeah, I mean, but, but it, it doesn't really have to be streaming. It, the, what is conti gonna continue happening is monetization from music consumption. Monetization is gonna keep happening, exactly, uh, yeah. Some people believe that maybe streaming is not uh, sustainable. Maybe TikTok is gonna launch their own streaming platform, which would be a different thing because it would be integrated with user-generated content. 
Um, a lot of copyright holders and investors right now are confident that the use of music in video games, the use of music on Twitch is going to become better monetized, especially in emerging markets. And that also brings uh, a little bit of a bullish expectative to have uh, catalogs earning more money than they're actually earning right now. So yeah, I mean, all probabilities are um, tilt tilted towards actually making more money rather than having a disruption that is going to render these future cash flows void. Um, the other thing that I wanted to, to, to mention a little bit is that there are some ideas in this part of the industry of, of uh, music catalog evaluation that are always going around, especially between economists, which is that right now that investment banks and big companies are becoming uh, copyright holders, they have an incentive to actually push for this monetization, monetization to maintain and to actually increase. So usually digital disruption like Napster uh, was ahead of, the, of companies because companies did not really have an incentive to also uh, digitally disrupt or to be technologically advanced. But now that uh, big players with a lot of money are in the place of copyright holders, they want to maintain their, their position. So they're going to do everything in their power to maintain this monetization. Um, this includes both lobbying and also investment in technologies that allow for that. And uh, so, yeah, I, I think it's a very, very bullish market right now. And this is what also relates to the other factors that made uh, catalogs attractive to investors that I wanted to touch on a little bit. So like I mentioned before, the stability of streaming revenues allows for investors to have confidence that these cash flows are going to be certain. That's why these music catalogs are usually seen as fixed income assets, uh, which are similar to a bond, basically. And uh, and also the fact that, which is very important, that these revenues have low correlation to the economy. So what happened, for example, with COVID, um, you know, the life part of, uh, of the music industry was very much affected. But the biggest percentage of the revenues were from streaming. And streaming, I mean, it continued going during COVID. So an event like COVID was for the music revenues, just a small to medium blip. So this makes the asset quite attractive because you can really rely on it not being related to the economy. And also it has a very, very high uh, payout way higher than, for example, a U.S. Treasury bond, let's say a U.S. Treasury bond, five years maturity, uh, music catalog can have doubled the yield of that bond. So this is a fantastic, um, I mean, it's a fa truly a fantastic asset for investors. And well, since it is treated as a fixed income asset, another thing that we have to take into account is the interest rates, uh, because, you know, a fixed income asset basically is valuable because uh, the return they bring to investors can be higher than the one in the market. Uh, the cost of opportunity for investors for a safe, low volatility cash flow could be, for example, um, I don't know, let's say 4%. And a music catalog can render you something like 12% if you pay the right price. So... That's why uh, the low interest rates that ha have been held in the market for a long time, particularly in the U.S., has have favored the preference from the, for these music assets. However, a lot of people are contending this, given the fact that interest rates are seemingly going to go up. But uh, this depends on how much the price of these music catalogs depends on on these interest rates, because in in the case of a bond. The price depends entirely on the interest rates and, well, a little bit on the probability of default of the company that issued the bond, but mostly about, it's about the interest rate. But uh, with uh, these music catalogs, they, even though they treat them as fixed income assets, they're not really fixed income assets. They're actually variable because like what you mentioned before, imagine you purchase Kate Bush's catalog before it was being featured in Stranger Things. You modeled a steady income in the future. However, after the Stranger Things boom, uh, the song has been featured in many, many playlists. It has reached a new audience. 
it has become uh, viral. So it has a, a new, a completely new decay curve. So if you value that song before, you would have a completely different, different value than you would absolutely. Have. So this proves that this is not really a fixed income asset. This is a variable asset, right? So this is what differentiates it from a bond. Even though, um, if this doesn't happen, if it continues to be stable, it just it, it acts the same as a bond. So investors are still going to be drawn to it for hedging, for diversifying portfolios, etc. Man, you have answered like 20 questions I've had along the podcast, like in three seasons, I swear. Like I've always asked like the difference between like a bond and, the, and a catalog. And finally, like I think we're getting to those. So it's, it's, it's amazing. Um, still though, I, I wanted to ask like, um, even though I understand the argument that it should not be treated as a fixed income asset, it still should be very sensible to the interest rates, right? Because like the Kate Bush example, I think, or... Uh, like treating a music catalog as a variable income asset should be the exception, not the rule. Actually, mm -hmm. the rule should be more like a fixed asset. So exactly, um, yeah. In most can, cases, it continues like, being a fixed income. It asset. should be that the prices go down now a little bit, given what you said that their mm -hmm. interest rates are going up. Like uh, that's what I think. I don't know if I'm, I might be wrong or not. That's one thing. And I, and the other thing is, I want you, like, if you can touch a little bit more on because you were talking to us behind the scenes before we start recording that you have worked a lot in like models of like valuing catalogs. And I'm super interested into that and like go as sophisticated as you can. Cause like, I think for many people out there, including me, it's like, oh, it's like a bond. You just discount the, 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 the future cash flow to, by a, by an interest rate. So what else goes into that valuation okay. of catalog? If you can, if you can go and go as sophisticated as possible, like complete freedom <laughs> for nerdiness. <Yeah. laughs> yeah, no, of course, of course. Uh, so uh, going to the first part that you asked about, I, I agree. I agree that interest rates have, have a very, very important um, effect on the price specifically, which is why price has a little bit stabilized and multiples, like I mentioned, have yeah. reached. So some people mentioned that it may go a little lower. I don't know how low they're going to go because aside from interest rates, they also, these multiples also depend on the, on the demand that these, that these catalogs have. And the catalogs are a finite, um, you know, you only have a specific number of catalogs. Yeah. A lot of people say they're going to run out eventually. I don't know about that, but like the most valuable and secure ones are going to run out eventually. So they become more valuable, especially if you are a, a holding that already has like a huge number of catalogs. So, so yeah, the price is definitely affected by interest rates, but we'll see how, how low. How much? I don't think they will go that low because the appetite is still there. So yeah, that that's about the first part that you mentioned. And the second part, well, yeah, the, these models are um, are very sophisticated models. What we try to do is to predict how the the uh, future cash flows are gonna uh, continue. So for this, what we use is public data on Nielsen or uh, other sources that tell us how a specific song is uh, performing in the charts, performing in uh, different formats of consumption, the physical, streaming, airplay, everything. We take into account everything. And we also take into account the statements of the um, uh, monetization sources. So this can be the publishers, the labels, the um, distributors, uh, Series XM, 1RPM, they also give us this, the statements if the song is being distributed through that. Uh, we also get the statements from PROs. So we get everything, everything that uh, the song makes all over the world. And uh, what we do is to try to uh, model the trend of the song based also in the um, maturity of the song and the point in the decay curve. So we have different decay curves for different genres, for different uh, artists, for different artists in different moments in, of, of their life, for different consumer profiles. And to build a curves, we take into account um, models that are brought from, um, that can be uh, bought from other investment banks on how the industry, the entertainment industry is gonna continue, uh, what is, uh, is expected or not to be uh, an uplift in the industry. So what we do with this is to try to create a bunch of scenarios. 
a pessimistic scenario, the most probable scenario, and an optimistic scenario. And this gives us a wiggle room for uh, negotiating. Perfect. Basically, that's that's the process we, we go through. It's gathering a lot of metadata, putting them into a statistical models to predict that take into account macroeconomic factors, industry factors, and specific factors of the catalog. And uh, and yeah, then it's all negotiation. <laughs> That's amazing, man. I, I don't want to sound simplistic, but so it's it's all about how you uh, build this decay curve mainly. That's yes. what's mainly all about. So yes. I, I wanted to understand. Amazing, amazing. Mm -hmm. yeah. hearing, hear, hearing all this, makes me wonder, for example, with all these models that you have run and all these like different case scenarios based on actual data on different catalogs of music, mm -hmm. what would you say, maybe it's a stupid question, but I want to ask you because I'm actually curious about like your opinion. Mm -hmm. What would you say is the optimistic or the utopic music catalog that you would be like, okay, you should invest in this catalog because it needs to have this, this, this and that. Like it needs to be proven that it's going to be like, making you get like money, like revenue income through a period of time, but at the same time, it might be potentially viral or like this kind of stuff, for example. Yeah, I know, I know what you mean. So like you, you want to know like indicators that a catalog is going to be valuable, that you can spot right, right at the, at the, well, to be honest, it has a lot to do with the um, intuition that the people who brought who bring us the deals have they know the industry pretty well um we also try to look into trending on tiktok trending on different markets trending on video games uh recent sync licensing uh that kind of stuff but at the moment we are not looking at um a sophisticated approach that we would like uh because you know this is a growing a growing part of the industry as it grows i do foresee that we're gonna get much more much more stronger stronger models so what i would uh love to do for example uh would be to take into account characteristics of the catalog of the music compositions characteristics of the songs that you can actually foresee okay this is going to be viral or this is going to be featured in a, in a movie because right now movies are using songs with these specific uh, features or songs by this specific type of artists. But this is all, uh, it, it is really, really hard to predict. Uh, it depends on, the virality depends on yeah. factors that you cannot really put your finger on. But we really want to work on making it as confident as possible. Um, so yeah, hopefully in a few years, I will have a much clearer answer for your question. But yeah, it was- In, it was, in, the, in the future, I'm going to be expecting like, hey, Luis, Buy this catalog. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just press the button and be like, okay, I'm going to be, be, I'm gonna be saving millions in case. You're uh -huh. just going to wait your text. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> I'm done for that. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, one thing I, I wanted to touch on um, was the, I mean, one thing that has been in the media recently is not only the, the selling of these catalogs, but what investment banks do with these deals. Um, so, because these are secure, stable, predictable assets, uh, they are also great candidates for securitization, which is what David Bowie did, right? But David Bowie did it only with his catalog. Um, right now, what is happening is that investment banks are, are drawn to this market uh, because uh, securitization allows an investment bank to get very cheap funding. So uh, let me explain. It is very similar to what happened with the mortgage-backed securities. That the idea is that you repackage a million of mortgage into uh, mortgages into bonds, and you get the money from it today. So it's future money that you get today. It's in the form of debt uh, because it, you know you have to repay through the cash flows. Uh, but it's it's a great opportunity for investors to get a lot of money to invest in other things. So what has happened recently? Uh, I mean. You know, many constituents of the recent catalog deals have already got into these kind of transactions because it's usually a partnership between an investment bank and a music company. Music company could be a label or a publisher or some other form of uh, of music company, like Hypnosis, which is not really a label or a publisher. It's more they call themselves a song fund, which is a interesting concept that we can touch on a little bit later. But yeah, the things that I wanted to bring into the table were the the recent 
transactions that have done this. Uh, the most notorious are uh, the one from KKR, which is an investment fund that by the end of 2021, they bought $1.1 billion worth of music rights from Cobalt and used them to issue a bond. They didn't use the whole uh, catalog. They used only a part. And they issued a bond of $700 million. These bonds were backed by music from The Weeknd, Stevie Nicks, Childish Gambino, and many more uh, artists. And in a similar fashion, Apollo Global Management, uh, which is a finance giant, sold a $1.65 billion bond backed by Concord's own music catalogs. Northleaf Capital also did the same. They issued an asset backed security, which is another name for a bond, worth $300 million uh, using Spirit's ownership uh, of catalogs. Spirit is another publishing company here in the States. And uh, finally, of course, hypnosis could not be left out. They, uh, you know, through the investment partnership with Blackstone, they issued uh, in 2022, I believe, a royalty backed security price in $222 million. And of course, all of these structured debt notes are rated at the highest investment grade. They are all triple A because they are so secure. Uh, so this is a very, very interesting phenomenon. A lot of people talk about uh, the similarities it has with what banks have been doing for years, you know, collateralizing debt. Um, but yeah, this also uh, links up with why really banks are getting into these deals, right? So institutional investors have a huge stake in these deals. In, in most asset purchase agreements for acquisitions, investment banks partner with labels, publishers, like I mentioned. Uh, so what we have to keep in mind here is that investment banks have a different line of business than that of those music companies. Uh, they, for an investment bank, their line of business is to create value and time by dealing with financial assets. So it's, it's basically a money business. So following the financial axiom that money is worth more today than tomorrow, uh, it is very safe to say that incentives are placed for financial institutions to realize those earnings today. That's why securitization exists. And well, of course, it reduces funding costs, it diminishes the cost of opportunity. And in the case of the rare cases like imagine Kate Bush catalog again, it could actually render capital gains if the asset ends up being worth more in, in the future. So financial institutions are captivated by these, by these characteristics. Um, and that's why they are into this market. The um, the incentives for a publisher or a label are a little bit different, though. Oh, I, I just see your... I wanted to understand a little bit more how is that relationship between the investor and and the, the publishing uh, company or the label? Because mm -hmm. I remember uh, the first time we talked about it, like when we were talking about the episode, was that uh, probably this kind of relationship is goes a little bit beyond the label or the publisher being just the administrator mm -hmm. right yes they like and we are just like a, like guessing here right but mm -hmm. they, they probably have another financial incentive because otherwise and i'm quoting you here it would be only like another label or another publisher kind of representation it wouldn't be yeah. any kind of different there exactly. so Uh, like, can, can you expand a little bit more on that? Yeah, I mean, uh, to answer your question, I wanted to go into uh, what makes publishers and labels go into this market as well. So for them, owning um, uh, music copyright is not just a financial decision. It is also an operating one because the music company's line of business is actually the administration of music. And that's what they are good in. Uh, that's what they do, right? Uh, so particularly for publishers, Uh, their line of business is owning a percentage of the royalties. Uh, and as it is most common lately, uh, what they sign the most are co-publishing agreements, mm -hmm. which is they manage the, uh, the, the, the publishing catalog and they get a fee from it. Um, these are the, the types of deals that have been more common in the recent years, but This is not really that much of a sustainable business in the long run. That's why a lot of publishers are actually thinking, okay, we have to do what um, hypnosis is doing and becoming a song fund rather than a publisher and start getting catalogs. 
So becoming the sole owner of the music catalog increases the incentive of an administrator to do the best job possible placing the catalogs in outlets uh, that propel the revenue, right? Like streaming playlists or trend content or sync licensing. So like I said before, uh, these assets owned by a music company are not just financial assets, but but operating assets. So the goal is to of these modern companies is to manage a large catalog that maintains the value in time, remains relevant, and guarantees the company's sustainability in the long run, while the company continues to foster the creation of new songs, new music, new talents. And it even gives room for spaces in which old catalog can be remixed, interpolated, covered, or referenced by new music. And this creates synergies in the long run. So a large enough catalog places the company in a very advantageous position, uh, also with negotiation with streaming platforms. This is something that Mer Mer Mercury Artist talks a, uh, a lot about. It leverages um, his his idea that it, I mean, that he actually works in benefit of all songwriters. And, you know, this is reshaping the way these companies do business in the way that they are becoming more of a song fund rather than a, than a publisher. So in the partnerships that happen between labels for publishers and investment banks, there is a symbiotic partnership, right? They need each other. The labels and publishers need the investment bank because they need the capital. They need to raise capital fast for, for these acquisitions. And the investment banks need someone to administer the uh, the catalog, right? So they, that's why they need each other. Yeah. So like you mentioned, just administering would be uh, would be the same as continue being just a publisher or just a, a signer of a co-pub deal. Uh, so yeah, you mentioned they need an incentive. That's why this is, um, we don't really have the uh, detail of this because these deals are highly confidential. But it is yeah. safe to say that they share um, ownership. And of course, there is a negotiation between them of how much this ownership. In some cases, KKR, like, like the KKR uh, deal that I mentioned, KKR bought the entirety of, uh, of Cobalt's catalog. In some other cases, like, for example, John Legend's catalog, uh, which was very recent, it was actually um, public knowledge that the catalog purchase was split 50-50% between KKR and BMG. So it was different from Cobalt, the KKR bought the whole thing. So it varies uh, depending on the deal. I, I see I have your... Uh, yeah. Your and, and naturally flowing also, like just to start like wrapping up things, like very recently there was a, a conversation or a news basically, but because Scott Cohen, which was the founder of the what we know today, the Orchard, mm -hmm. uh, he resigned to his to his job in 2022 as like innovator director blah 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 of Warner, but now he has his new company called Jukebox, right? Mm -hmm. And what he is planning to do is to allow retail investors to get access to, let's say, buy catalog. Like you, Max, as Max can buy, I don't know, music Max from Max Martin or or Marici. Avicii. You know, Predictable. As, as so, <laughs> so I wanted I wanted to 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 know uh, your thoughts about it, like and also like you guys, like would you guys buy uh, a catalog, like as like a natural person, would you buy music from your favorite artist? But as an investment, yeah, like, let's consider. Yes, I'm a fan, but also like we are dealing here with money, right? So I, I want this capital to grow over the future. So what are your thoughts, first, Felipe? Yes, uh, I think it's a very, very interesting possibility. I think it's going to be further down the future. I don't think we are there yet. Uh, the reason why is because, you know, this, the companies doing these deals right now are so big and they are so confidential in what they're doing. Uh, and they want their interest just in that, that it's going to take a while for to develop a business model that allows people to actually invest because it would it would take the initiative of a financial institution to do it uh so but i think it's a great uh, i mean it would be great i would love to buy a, a percent catalog and that's something that i talk about with people all the time you know even my roommates i mean i have two roommates one of them is also in the music industry and the other one's a doctor and the one who's a doctor, he always tells me, I, I don't understand why I can't buy just a share of catalog. I mean, I I um I have the money to invest and I want to invest in music, 
why why I'm not allowed to do that? Uh, and you know that there were some initiatives with NFTs that were trying to do this. You know, like mm-hmm, the mm-hmm. Oculus. I did. I remember Oculus tried to do it with City Baby. Exactly. Yeah, but these haven't really become like an industry trend or a thing that is generalized for the public. It's still very niche. It's still very experimental to see how it goes. So yeah, I, 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 I think it would be great to see it eventually because it also links up to the idea of, um, of music fan zone and the importance of the super fan. You know how they always talk about how independent artists could actually sustain themselves if they have like a thousand fans that are willing to spend $300 on them. Uh, so uh, I think if you had like a large pool of fans who are willing to invest in an artist, it could really be beneficial for emerging um, <clears throat> music industries. You know, for example, like the Latin America music industry that lacks a lot of infrastructure, lacks finance. Um, I think this would be a good approach. However, uh, it's very different to be a fan than to be an investor. Be, I mean, That's exactly what I was... Exactly. The, the, the best mix would be that it's both a fan and an investor. Someone in, actually invested that has invested interest, not only monetary interest in it. Um, so yeah, I mean, this links up also with the ideas of crowdsourcing and crowdfunding uh, to develop an industry, which is something I would love to see. I, I really think this is a potential for financing an industry, but the way how it's going to be approached and how it's going to enter the market uh, has a lot of aspects to it. It's probably, it probably belongs to another conversation, but but I think it, it has a huge potential for, for growth. At the end, if people start losing money because they are starting investing in music catalogs without like knowing what to do, don't blame <laughs> the artists, blame yourself first. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I think it would make a little bit more sense to rather than ownership of catalog, it would be financing backed by or guaranteed by the value of the catalog, right? Because ownership, you know, can be uh interpreted in different ways if it's the, if it's a starting artist it is really hard to to foresee whether this artist is going to be the next bad bunny for example imagine they give away their ownership just because they need money right away and in the end it's, it's it, it becomes owned by a pool of investors uh who are regular people and they just lost that copyright so a lot of people would call that unfair it would be i think more fair to have them have uh some sort of microfinance loan rather than losing their ownership right but but i'm sure that it's going to develop on a way that if this goes on like something around it is going to develop for indie artists to start having like this kind of i don't know like advice before selling anything to anyone that probably do not know or do know Yeah. something about the music business right yeah but but this is also an economic problem because it is gonna it's gonna have to go through an intermediary so it's gonna it's gonna have a gatekeeping uh institution so that can all, always be problematic but but it's something it's an idea that i've i've been given a lot of thought to recently it's something that i would love to do in the future and this is a market with a lot of potential to raise capital to build um an infrastructure in emerging markets, which is something that I would love to tap into lately. I mean, uh, further down my career. Um, so yeah, I think I think we, we're just gonna have to see it develops and try to make the most of it. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think also brings back to the point of eventually, right, the whole thing of catalogs being bought doesn't depend mostly on streaming. It's, it's all about the the revenue stream to right holders and which this will enables another one, right? Giving access to natural people like us to invest, like a roommate investing music, mm -hmm. it will enable like a big flow <clears throat> of cash flow towards right holders, not just the big labels, big publishers, but also indie artists, maybe, I don't know, independent distributors as well that mm -hmm. are tapping into all these different ways of financing uh, yeah. Bitbread, for instance, that are financing artists in different ways. Because for instance, Bitbread, what they do, they don't necessarily uh, get the artist, uh, 
uh, asset, but somehow mm -hmm. in the agreement, what they want to do is to get access to the royalty side, yes. being owners of that side. But as you said, like probably this belongs to another conversation. Yeah. Uh, uh, like, and we want to keep this short and nice. Mm -hmm. But uh -huh. Felipe, thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so no, much for sharing thank your you. knowledge. This, this was amazing. Like, for Luis, the first guest, almost yes. didn't understand anything for what we were saying. It was a master class. Like, I'm, yeah. I was just waiting for the actual juice. I was like, just let me know when I'm, I'm going to press the button to start like financing shit. Like, <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you, guys. This, this was amazing. I, I, I really enjoyed talking to you. Uh, and yeah, let's let's keep in touch. Let's see what uh, opportunities arise in the market. And uh, I'll keep you posted how how the um, the catalog valuation business continues. Um, so yeah. Thank you. Absolutely. Absolutely, man. So uh, just to let you know, the channel is yours. Uh, I don't know if you have any plug to let people what you're uh, having going on in your life. Uh, is there something that you want to highlight? Uh, how can people mm -hmm. contact you? Uh, well, yes. Uh, my name is Felipe Garrido. I'm on LinkedIn and Instagram, pretty, pretty much every uh, social media. Um, I'm currently finishing my master's in music business at NYU. I plan to maybe stay here in New York or maybe move to London, uh, depending on what opportunities arise. Uh, but but yeah, I'm, I, I'm also soon to publish um, a different article that doesn't really touch on music catalogs. It, it's more about the longevity of artists in music uh, and try to profile different artists and how to, to have a long lasting and successful career. I think that's also going to be very interesting. Uh, but yeah, thank you for the platform. Uh, this has been truly, truly an honor. Uh, so hopefully we will talk again. People, uh, you heard it here. Welcome to another uh, season of 8,000 kilometers. We'll have more, more guests. As Felipe said, mentioned, he mentioned about Spirit Music. Yes, we'll have the CEO of Spirit Music here, Spirit Music for Latino. We're going to talk about data also this month. We're going to talk about... We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna witness how Max's music taste is going to improve yeah. bit by bit. <laughs> and, and, and how Jose, how Jose start like digging a little for bit free. deeper into different genres as well. Oh, oh. <laughs> I, I always receive one for free, you know, always, always, <laughs> always one for free. Jewish, we're gonna, we're gonna, like this 2023 we're gonna get a uh, to get no to, <laughs> we're gonna get Jose to at least 20 genres 20 different genres that doesn't involve reggaeton or something like that music that's not in four forks <laughs> and it's like and it's not like with tumbao or something you know, like. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway beautiful people we'll see you next week welcome again season three we'll see you next week bye 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 Hey, si ya llegaste hasta acá, muchas gracias por escucharnos. No te olvides de seguirnos en Spotify, Apple Music, Pandora o la plataforma digital que sea de tu preferencia. Si te gustó el capítulo, si te gusta el podcast, no olvides recomendarnos a tu grupo de amigos, colegas. Esa es la mejor manera y la manera más orgánica de que sigamos creciendo esta comunidad. También nos puedes encontrar en Instagram, Facebook, YouTube como 8000 kilómetros Podcast y cualquier comentario, duda, sugerencia para mejorar el podcast es más que bienvenida. Nos vemos en el siguiente episodio.